There's going to be two of us. One's going to try and work the buttons and the other to try and do most of the talking. We'll see how it goes. Right. right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And I think, first of all, we have to explain why this title. And it's because of comments made by previous VAG presidents. One saying that there won't be much there and the other that its position doesn't help. But here we have two illustrations of Harwich, and the one to the right being the earliest known map of 1610. And we hope that this short presentation will encourage you all to visit. Essex as a maritime county has a surprisingly long and indented coastline with Harwich at the mouth of the store and Orwell rivers having one of the best natural harbours on the East Coast. Most people today only know it as one of the main routes to the continent, but this connection has shaped its development from early times. A package service started in the 1700s. Philip Morant, in his publication of 1768, describes the town as being 72 miles from London. It stands on a point of land at the northeast corner of Essex, bounded on the east by the sea and on the north by the mouth of the store and the famous haven of Orwell. Daniel Defoe, some 40 years earlier, described the town as one of hurry and business, not much gaiety and pleasure, and some inhabitants being very wealthy. Formerly, it was walled round and had four gates, a castle and an admiralty house, but they are all either gone to sea or ruinous. The Dukes of Norfolk had a large house and were possibly the main developers from the 1200s. In 1297, Edward I held a parliament at Harwich on town planning, and the town still maintains its medieval street pattern. The adjacent sketch, although not technically correct, gives an idea of the number of gables within medieval Harwich. As with Essex, there is no good free stone, but the area does have the advantage of nodules of septaria or mudstone within the grey clay beds of the cliffs. It needs to be exposed for a considerable time before becoming completely petrified, and the illustration shows septaria used in the cellar wall of 20 Church Street. Defoe comments that the residents boast that their town is walled and their streets paved with clay, and yet that one is as strong and the other as clean as those that are built or paved with stone. However, as with the majority of medieval buildings within Essex, the buildings of Harwich are mainly timber framed. It developed as a major military port, always with soldiers manning gun emplacements right up to the Second World War, had major commerce and shipbuilding became a main centre port of Trinity House, who still control major areas today with a large private jetty to service their supply ships. A royal charter was granted to Trinity House by Henry VIII in 1514, and in 1676, Samuel Pepys was master of Trinity House, secretary to the Navy, and Harwich MP. We will look at some of the buildings in King's Head Street, Market oh, Street, sorry. and Church Street, a varying plan, form, and development. 
By the 17th century, the fashion for gables, as is seen in London panoramas of the time, had reached Harwich. Unfortunately, many were lost in the major 18th, 19th century changes of new facades, buildings in brick, completely redeveloped sites, and the major losses in the Second World War through heavy bombing. The buildings were visited during a heritage lottery funded project, trying to identify those in existence before Mayflower, Mayflower <laughs> sailed in 1620. So please fasten your seatbelts. The building complex, numbers 24, 25 the Alma and 26, are on the northeast side of King's Head Street and in part extends through to Eastgate Street. With a street frontage of over 70 foot, it was a major site close to the quay. Suggested that the buildings are the remaining elements of a three cell or alternate build double cross wing or range. Research has shown that many Essex buildings are updated by alternate rebuild. Example, slotting a new two-story hall between two medieval cross wings, so achieving an update without a complete rebuild. The earliest surviving phase is number 24, the North Cross Wing, which represents a two bay timber framed parlor, much changed when converted to a single property. It was accessed from the lost open hall by a doorway against the rear wall. Little work, early work is visible today, but sufficient remains to indicate that it was jettied towards the street and probably dates from the 14th century. This part is still in separate ownership and in fact unlisted. The present South Cross Wing was constructed to a very high standard during the closing years of the 15th century and is a two bay structure formerly with a jettied first floor and gable. Access from the hall was by a doorway off centered towards the rear. It comprised a single room on each of its two stories with the first floor accessed by external stairs to the rear. Entered from the low end, it did not appear to have fulfilled a service function, but more likely commercial, similar to that found at 14 Church Street during the Discovering Cobbleshaw project. This slide shows some suggested dates for a now much changed building. Sadly, no timbers were suitable for Dendro. The main areas are number 24, the North Cross Wing, the Alma Inn, number 26, the South Cross Wing, the Added Porch and Link Buildings to Eastgate Street. These drawings are by kind permission of the Martins show the hall range now the Alma Inn rebuilt in the early 16th century as a two story close studded jetted building with brick infill to the front and rear elevations. Fenestration pattern is a central oriel to each bay of the front with flanking frieze windows. These have surviving mullions with intricate mouldings, appear to have originally been unglazed with deep rebates in the wall plates above to house sliding wooden shutters. No firm evidence could be found for the height of the low hall, open hall that the existing building replaced. However, the roof of the new hall has an unusual construction 
with an off-center axial beam, so keeping the main roof height the same as the front gables. The ground floor is now converted to the main bar of the inn. The visible main structural timbers were deeply molded and a later stack against the cross passage was removed in the 19th century to make the main serving area. On the bottom section, the surviving structure of number 24 can be seen and the parlor doorway against the rear wall. These drawings show the surviving elements of the front and rear elevations of the range. The fenestration pattern, the oriel to the south cross wing, and unfortunately, as in many places, many question marks at ground floor. The ground floor of the Alma as it is today, with the lower section of the later stack removed to create the main bar area, a visible section of transverse molded beam, and inset is a photograph of the doorway to the parlor. First floor interiors of the hall chamber show the open trusses set against the earlier cross wings. A surviving frieze window and the brick infill or brick nogging below and intricately molded beams. The rear elevation of the hall today with surviving frieze windows and elements of the timber framing. And this is the off-center block doorway from the south cross wing into the hall and faint painted decoration survived on the door jams. And on the same wall facing into the cross wing was a remnant of painted plaster panelling. And this is a close up of the painted panelling in the south cross wing. And we were very fortunate that have, to have Andrea Kirkham, who produced a report on the painted panelling and the remnants of the earlier schemes for the project. And this is a view into the restored porch at first floor level. And note the stud mortises showing that the porch was positioned overlapping an original window. And here we have a section of the original brick infill or brick nogging to the front wall of the south cross wing but unfortunately no signs of the penciling that Tim showed us in his earlier talk. And to the left we have the rear first floor doorway and right repositioned from the crown post roof the collar purlin and brace used to support the inserted attic floor. Stair positions to the first floor of the cross wing were much changed over time and this is the existing winder stair in the rear extension. There is now a substantial brick building onto Eastgate Street, and this is linked through to the Alma Inn. A recent architect's drawing actually shows the maze that is now the Alma Inn. 
colors suggest possible earlier development, such as blue for the frontage range, green for the linking building, and red possible warehouse site prior to the brick building. Another shows a well marked in yellow and a rain back marked in black that have just been found. And the well may relate to a kitchen mentioned in a 1538 inventory. And here are some interesting notes regarding the Alma, which was almost certainly a merchant's house. And we know it was in the hands of a Dutchman or alien, John Lambard, early in the 16th century. He may have been responsible for many of the changes. In his probate inventory of 1538, his estate was valued at 154 pounds 14 shillings and sevenpence that included the Alma, some shipping as well as goods in store. The main development of the building was in the 15th to 17th centuries. The link behind the South Cross Wing may be a rebuild of an earlier building required as the property developed with a possible store to the Eastgate frontage on which the 18th century building now stands. This would be similar to waterfront development in London with living area and covered ways to the warehouses. We can only speculate, but the reconstructions produced by David Martin show it to be a very imposing building. And this is the first one reconstructed as in the 15th century, where we see the North Cross Wing, the open hall, and then the very imposing South Cross Wing with its brick infill. And the second reconstruction as in the 16th, 17th century, with the rebuilt hall and the added porch, all making a very imposing building. And it's interesting to note that the cross passage door is still an entrance to the Alma. We're now going to move to Church Street and consider another three cell building hall and double cross wing house. And this is 14 to 16 Church Street, a building that has had extensive remodeling in the 17th and 18th centuries. And I'm sure all of you now looking at it will find it difficult to visualize it with gabled cross wings and low central hall. And this is a plan of the assumed first phase with possible shop workshop to the front bay of the low end and note the shop doorway close to the front wall of the hall and that to the service room against the rear wall. The open hall and parlor cross wing. And at first floor, a two bay parlor chamber and at the low end, another two bay open chamber. A fairly standard plan. And inside remaining framing of the high end cross wing with a remnant of front jetty structure. Surviving evidence for the arched head window or braced opening, suggesting the possible commercial use. And now looking at the changes in the 17th century, some suggested, others have 
um, firm remaining evidence. They consist of the addition of a cellar across the front range, two-story hall, stairs and lateral stack, a rear range added, and the roof raised and realigned as in the picture. The first floor petitions were rearranged to create a large parlour chamber. A jetty bresimer has been repositioned internally, which has the initials T, E and S, dated 1606. If recited from the front <coughs> elevation, possible candidates identified by the Harwich Society are Thomas and Elizabeth Shreve. And this is typical mouldings of quadrant chamfers and lamb's tongue stops with the additional notch of the 17th century as found in the new rear extension. And similar mouldings have been found in other 17th century buildings in Harwich. The decorated first floor ceiling of the parlour chamber that's now cut by later petitions and some typical detail decoration taken from both first floor ceilings and many ceilings with similar motives have also been found in other Harwich buildings. A view of the joggled side pearl in roof of phase two that utilizes many earlier timbers. And another shot of the side purlin roof with the collar removed later Oops. to obtain usable attic space. And here we have evidence for moulded mullions to a phase two window at ground floor level, but unfortunately the shadow marks of the mullion profile were barely visible. And this is a general view in the cellar, which is all of brick construction. And these are cellar joists under the parlour crosswing that have tenter hooks set at eight inch centers that are in two foot runs, then a two foot space and another two foot run at eight inch centers on both sides of the joists. And this is a detail of the hook and any suggestions for use would be very welcome. And the rear elevation as it is now after later 18th century infill and subsequent division. And this building under consideration, 26 Church Street, consists of one surviving bay of a long wall jetted building visible as the higher section of roof with a rear extension of two unequal bays, all now incorporated into this 19th century building. And this is the plan of the left hand section of the building, giving the dendro dates obtained for these two builds by Dr. Martin Bridge. Interestingly, the present front door coincides with the former throughway as evidenced by a first floor window. The first floor is an open truss to the now demolished section and the ground floor has of the rear range and first floor have lots of nice dating features. And this is the crown post roof of the 1485 bay 
of the long walled jetted building. And so many of the Harwich buildings have had a roof raised that now crown posts, rent, crown <laughs> posts are thin on the ground. And this is the original ground floor to the rear extension that was jetted. The Bressemer had a quadrant moulding with the jetty plate originally inset under. And this is a close detail under the Bressemer showing the fixing peg and shadow of a jetty plate. The first floor bay partition showing close studding with trench Colchester style bracing, i.e. upright to upright. The tightly curved profile of the braces is unusual for the area, as is the square cut brace mortise housing. And finding one in a similar position would almost suggest a possible door head. And beside it, you've one surviving visible freeze window in the side wall. And here we have a slide uh, showing the composite details of the building. 21 Market Street is now seen as a 19th century shop of three stories, possibly an encroachment into the former open market area. Plans show the rear range behind the shop as a timber frame building of two storeys with attic with two bays plus on the ground floor a narrow bay to the rear constructed as an open arcade. The building is side jetty to the east and is closely dated by a carved date of 1588. The roof consists of two A-frame trusses to the attic area and the original tie beam has now been removed. This is a view of visible remains of the side jetty and you can see the removed wall with door opening and stud mortises showing. Substantial joisting to the attic floor. The stair position to the attic and no joist mortises showing in the transverse beam. The A-frame side purlin roof with principal rafters, wind bracing and a pegged opening in the roof. The decorated Bressemer to the side jetty and a close up of the detail of the carving and the Harwich Society with cross fingers are still hoping to match the initials to an owner. A repositioned carved post and bracket now forming the door opening from the front shop range. The full length female figure is crowned and holds a mirror and shield. The door head to the rear open arcade, giving the date 1588. And this shows a selection of carving that appears in the rear open arcade with the corner post carved with a male figure of a bearded Elizabethan with crown and sword. And this is a view across the recently demolished adjacent building 
to show the rear range with side jetty and open arcade. And here we have partial demolition underway, showing a remnant of another two bay timber frame building, possibly 15th century, at right angles to number 21 Market Street. Unfortunately, the local authority had made no provision for recording and the timbers disappeared very quickly from the site. We're now at the south end of Church Street, looking from the corner of the churchyard, past the Hanover Inn to number 66. And this is the later brick facade of number 66 Church Street. And a plan of the original single cell building. This is how to build using what you've already got. So the original was built against the wall of the Hanover Inn. The cooking hearth has now been rebuilt and extends across the original stair trap. And this is the 15th century ground floor wall of the Hanover Inn, again with Colchester style bracing and the sill beam just visible. And a selection of the many very deep taper burns and a detail of the double pegged brace joint. And a view to the entrance with the 16th century flank timber framed wall. And the rear view of the stack now with the later stair in the extension. And this is the reused wall at first floor with later roof rays and the mid rail showing the ground floor story height of the inn. Still at the south end of Church Street is number four an 18th century house with brick front elevation and early 19th century door case. And just note the gambrel roof right at the, to the right of the parapet. And here we have ground and first floor plans showing the central stack flanked to the right by winder stairs that continue through to the attics and to the left alcoves and cupboards and a passageway that runs from the front through to the rear. And the first floor plan virtually is a repeat with the winder stairs continuing up to the right of the stack. Then we get to the second floor or first attic and then the upper attic floor which has four surviving in Harwich they call them pilot beds or you can also use box beds of two differing dates. And this relates so well to the Moxon plan as produced in his 1703 edition, where you can see the stack, stairs to the right, then cupboards and a passageway going from the front through to the back. And just a few internal shots showing the alcove and cupboards 
and then the start of the winder stairs with a small selection of shinwazari balustrade. The inner wall of the rear room, again with the a very nice alcove and cupboard. The principal for front first floor bedroom. The principal front second floor first attic bedroom now with dormer windows. And this is a shot of the later 19th century pilot box beds in the upper attic floor. And here we have a shot of the winder stair going down from the upper attic floor that takes us outside and helps us to conclude the visit. As the main news of the last week after this talk had been prepared was the death of the Duke of Edinburgh, his burial being during this conference, it seemed correct to say a few words. He was one who completely disregarded our chosen title for this talk and visited Harwich many times as a long serving master of Trinity House from 1969 to 2011. He took it through a major reorganisation and modernisation that included no more manned houses and night ships. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. He, he laid the first stone of the 10 million Trinity House building in George Street and opened it with the Queen. Other changes saw the new pilot's office on Harwich Quay and the big change to GPS and solar powered boys, all service from Harwich. This is the latest state of the art service vessel that operates in Harwich. The present master, by the way, is his daughter, Princess Anne. And we would like to give thanks to the Harwich Society who arranged all the visits to the buildings and provided additional research. Dr. Chris Thornton, Victoria County History Essex Editor, for insight into current Harwich research. David and Barbara Martin for their survey of the Alma, and of course, all of the house owners. And we've listed references if anybody wants to take up further study. Thank you.